Good morning, good morning all. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, uh, Leveraging Your Intangible Assets for Global Success. Uh, my name is Pei Wen and I lead the Enterprise Engagement in IPOS International. It's my pleasure to be the host again for this IP Expert Series Bootcamp. So before I go into today's sessions, I wanted to do a bit something a bit more differently. So I wanted um, whoever have joined us already in this webinar to help me with a quick poll so that we can understand you a bit more while we wait for more attendees to join us. So let me just launch the poll and then um, please help me to fill out uh, to, to answer the poll. And while we wait for more attendees to stream in. All right, good morning for those who have just joined us. Currently, we are launching a poll to help us understand um, you a bit better. So while we are waiting for more people to join us um, this morning, uh, please help us with the poll. And it really helps the speakers to understand you know, who they are actually speaking to and um, how they can share more insights um, that is more relevant to you. All right, we have more than 100 people joining us already. And, um, and we have more than 50% of the attendees who have actually helped to answer our poll. All right, we'll keep the poll going while I'll start the introductions. And then we'll end the poll uh, right after my introductions and before I introduce the speaker. All right, so good morning again. Welcome to the IP Expert Series Bootcamp. Leveraging your intangible assets for global success. So the IP Expert Series is IPOS international webinar series that delivers actionable insights and tips on intangible assets, which we call it IA, and intellectual property, which is, we call it IP, for innovative enterprises. So each interactive webinar features all such subject matter experts exploring topics on IP rights protections, strategy, international protection, monetization, and many more. And so for today, uh, I have the pleasure of inviting Ms. Lo Jingwei, the strategist of IPOS International, and Mr. Tyler Capson, Managing Director of Average, to share with us practical strategies to help you prioritize resources and capitalize on your strong IAIP position so that you can build a sustainable competitive advantage as you grow and enter new market. All right, so right now I'll stop the poll. Okay. So we do have, you know, companies um, who are based in Singapore, Southeast Asia, or even have offices globally. And, and wow, there's a lot of uh, a mixture of um, the areas that you guys are looking for uh, into when you're looking for overseas expansions. All right, and okay, good to know that, you know, majority of the attendees now has basic understanding of IAIP protection. So good information um, for our speakers. So before I pass the time over to the speaker, let me just do a quick introduction of them so that we get to know them better as well. So first of all, we have um, Jingwei. So uh, Jingwei has over a decade of experience in advising companies on IP matters, a believer in intangible assets as a driver for business growth. She has delivered strategic IP management solutions to a diverse um, industry, including telecommunications, medtech, IT, and retail. And Jingwei was involved in impact-driven IPOS initiative, which helped shape Singapore's innovation ecosystem, such as the Pioneer IP Management Program for government agencies and enterprises to further business growth with IP. And we have Mr. Tyler Capson, 
um, Tyler leads Average Intangible Assets Valuation Team and helps companies to drive revenue and growth by providing intangible assets consulting services around strategy, risk mitigations, valuations, and commercializations. So before Average, um, Tyler has worked in New York for Deloitte and Goldman Sachs, advising Wall Street banks and financial institutions, and worked on a number of high-profile transactions, including the Facebook IPO and the Apple Bond offering. Welcome, Tyler and Jingwei. So as the host, it's my job to brief you that in the midst of the presentations, if you have any questions to ask our speakers at any time, please type your questions using the Q&A function on this platform and we will get them answered during the Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let me pass the time to Jingwei first, who will share insights and practical advice on mapping your intangible asset strategies to your key business objective and getting your IAIP ready for the global market. Jingwei, please. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Taiwan. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. So uh, just a very, very quick background on top of what Taiwan has shared. Uh, I've been with IPOS for um, you know, a, couple of year, a number of years before joining uh, IPOS International, where I'm actually one of the IP strategies amongst the, the IP strategy solutions unit. Uh, and we work closely with companies on IP management uh, programs as well as IP matters. So. Before we start, uh, I'll just give a very, very quick introduction, although I know most of you are probably already familiar with us. Um, IPOS International is the wholly owned subsidiary of, I, uh, of the IP office, which is the National IP Office of Singapore. Uh, and it's a statutory board under Ministry of Law where you register your trademarks, your patents, your designs, etc. So yeah, we are very legit. We are also the expertise and enterprise uh, engagement arm with over 100 IP experts under one roof. So this includes the patent examiners where about 90% of them are actually PhD, uh, PhDs and trained to examine your invention to assess their eligibility for grants of a patent. So our goal is really to help enterprises better leverage on their intangible assets to help their business grow. So we have three areas of focus to help businesses with this. And um, one of them is actually to help uh, enterprises unlock their business value with intangible asset strategy. The next is actually using uh, data from pattern analytics, right, to gain industry insights. And also looking at building capabilities through IP education and, and training. This is one arm that has been around for almost as long as IPOS. There's uh, about 20 over years. So some of you might have heard of the IP Academy where we run regular courses. So the topic today is really looking at how we can leverage IA for global success. So my question to all is, can you actually leverage on what you don't own or recognize? So the answer is quite obviously a no. I mean, this is like going to pitch to a client and not knowing why they should use your services or products over others. So sometimes we may end up going down the route of competing on price, but that's not sustainable as most of us know because there will always be cheaper and better products out there over time. So how else then can a company actually work on recognizing and owning or securing assets that can help you articulate your competitive advantages? So today I'll actually be sharing five key tips on IP that will be relevant to companies that are seeking to go overseas. So the first thing a company actually needs to do, right, is to actually know what intangible assets you have. Using this example, right, of an intangible of a telehealth startup. So most companies would have some form of valuable intangible assets. I mean, that is why you get businesses, right? Like in this case, this telehealth company would probably have some trade secrets in its software, some know-how in the design of the software as well as processes, as well as the networks with which is KOLs, practitioners, pharmacies, et cetera. So when we talk about intangible assets, we actually refer to a larger group beyond registrable rights, which are the ones in orange in the center. So others that are not typically registered as IP assets, right, which are the purple ones, you'll notice that they're increasingly important as well. So you start hearing things like trade secrets um, that are being thrown around in those kind of IP, uh, FTA negotiations, et cetera. Uh, data, which has always been uh, increasingly important because like companies like Google, this would actually be a key asset. Uh, which is used to generate insights on user behavior so that they can develop new products or create better user experience to increase the stickiness as well as customer retention. Even your key systems 
and processes which actually make your business more efficient and cost-effective than competitors is potentially another class of intangible assets that should be recognized. So they are generally unseen, but valuable. And a lot of times you'll find that you can't register it to get a, to so-called showcase, your, show your ownership, but you need to put in place some form of management processes so you can make sure that you don't lose access to them. So the next thing you need to do, right, is actually to try to link your IP strategy to a business objective. So what do we mean by that? Okay, for example, uh, a company looking to bring its maybe coffee vending business, machine business overseas. So after you've done the first step to identify what kind of IP your business has, you can actually go through uh, an exercise to determine which of these assets are essential to achieve the business objective in this new market. So in the in the, in the uh, B2, B, B2C business like this, right, the brand name will actually be quite important. So this is usually associated with things like trademark protection in the country for the logo or the name the business is going to use to represent your goods and services, okay? So if there is a special aesthetics for the design of the machine, which actually draws the attention of passerbys or that you have spent um, you know, resources to develop, this may be something that's identified as important as well and registered for a, a design protection. So copyright content, I would imagine, actually be very important also because for this kind of B2C, right, increasingly people are going online to do social media marketing, where you may be working with external vendors or even influencers to develop content and, and help you push your brand. So you actually need to be very clear about the IP rights behind such creations, such as who owns it, what kind of rights do you have as a company, how many rights can you get out of this uh, content, how many runs can you get out of such content, etc. So the know-how of the crew on the ground as well overseas would be important as well to make sure that operations run smoothly. How do you actually refill your machines, top it up and make sure that you know uh, any problems are well serviced. So if you are working with a local partner, for example, ask yourself, would you be transferring any of this kind of knowledge to them? Okay. So linking your IP business, IP strategy to your business objective uh, is actually very, is very important because it's actually closely linked as shown here. Your business plan will set things like your overall goals uh, and then your IP strategy will actually show you what is the kind of IP assets that you need to support these goals. So this is what I kind of mentioned earlier. There are other opportunities that can be shown when you do your um, IP strategy, right? It can actually help you flag up new opportunities as well that may allow you to gain competitive advantages. And with that insight, you can actually prioritize these new opportunities in line with some of your commercial uh, objectives also. So just want to quickly um, share a little bit about a framework that we have. So in order to develop an IP strategy that can actually support your business objective, right? You need to be clear about which are the relevant key assets for your overseas venture. And to answer this, right, it always goes down to the business. You notice our conversations around the business rather than the legal aspects of IP. You have to ask yourself, what are your competitive advantages? Why do customers actually choose you over your competitors? Okay, so these are two questions always, always ask yourself. And then that's where you can kind of derive the intangible assets that can support these advantages. And we have a framework, which is called the Mad Growth Framework, which helps companies to do this. It's a really simple exercise where your company can actually ask yourself these six questions uh, relating to the market, the advantages, as well as the drivers of your business um, to arrive at a kind of key and tangible assets, which is the last part uh, that actually enables you to do your businesses better than others. Okay. So unfortunately, there isn't quite enough time to go through everything in detail here, but if you're interested to find out more, do reach out. We can see how we can share this with you. So the third thing, right, that you need to do before you, when you go overseas, right, is actually to prioritize your protection needs. So you may find that after the first two steps, right, okay, that well, I have so much, so much intangible assets that I'm unsure, what do I need to do next? How do I prioritize what to file? Should I file a pattern first? Should I file a trimmer first? Et cetera. Okay, so two key tips, okay. Before, um, you should actually look at uh, protecting assets that are generally generating more money or maybe have a higher risk of uh, exposure where perhaps you may be at risk of losing it when you go overseas um, due to copycats or perhaps your partner could just take it and go. Okay, so always try to secure your intangible assets before you go overseas if you can. So there are other considerations when you are prioritizing your protection needs, such as the cost, always weigh the cost and benefit of 
versus uh, versus benefit of protecting the IP asset because some assets like um some assets may actually be more costly to obtain and maintain, uh, especially with potential enforcement budget that you need to set aside. Because if there are infringers, sometimes you really need to go after them to stop them from you know, eating into your market share and, and using your, your IP without permission. Also the lifespan of IP assets. Always evaluate the expected lifespan of the asset when you're determining the priority. So if you are, if it's an asset that's like a one-off promotion, right? Maybe it's not worth investing in uh, some form of registration to protect it because the time taken to obtain it may actually be longer than the usage of the asset itself. So you have an, if you have an asset that's going to be a platform underlying your technology that will be used for multiple number of years, those are the kind that I'll prioritize uh, for, for some form of protection and registration. Okay. So the fourth step is actually to be clear about ownership rights. And this is particularly important because in the course of your business, right, there will be multiple parties who may be generating or handling work that touches on IP. Okay, so the IP that you're using right now may have been created by your founders, for example, your employees, both the present and ex, or you may have worked with suppliers or vendors to assess some of the intangible assets and bring it overseas, as well as partners um, over in other countries. So when you are looking at clarifying or securing this kind of IP ownership, right, we will highly recommend that you try and formalize contracts with these parties. So for example, you have a shareholder agreements, right? This should actually spell out which founder or co-founder own or co-own the company's IP. And you should definitely have clear agreements with your local partners to clarify who owns what, and also the enforcement rights, as well as IP ownership should the partnership actually dissolve. Always consider the termination it is like uh, it is like a marriage that in the end if you divorce, right? The assets can get very complicated. So always be clear upfront if you can. So and ensure that your um, employees actually assign their IP rights to the company and prevent claims of ownerships regarding the company's IP by both employees and suppliers. Because some countries, right? They may not have a default position where IP rights created by the company uh, by the employees are owned by the company. Even if they do, right, it's still advisable to actually have some form of employment uh, in your employment contract to ensure that your employees assign it over to the company so that there is no um, uncertainty in terms of the ownership rights. Okay. So the next one is actually a uh, very um, simple, but sometimes people just forget that home ground is different from, uh, from overseas. So do not assume the local rules are the same as the home ground. Okay. This is because IP protection is by jurisdiction. I, mean, I know that quite a number of you actually have basic understanding of IP rights. So I'm sure the, the ones in orange that I mentioned earlier, like the patterns, trademarks, those you might be familiar. Do note that these are by jurisdiction. So never, never assume that your IP is protected in the new market just because you have registered it in your country of origin. Okay. So always try and understand the scope of protection that's offered by the country because not all countries have comprehensive IP laws or a legal system for effective enforcement actions to be taken to protect your rights. Um, for example, if you are entering the region, right, you'll find a lot of countries may not be as advanced in terms of the IP rights protection as Singapore is. So in this kind of situation, always seek help from the local IP uh, professionals. If you're looking to register any rights, uh, don't assume that your trademark is protected just because you have it filed in Singapore. Okay, and when you're in doubt, right, try to put in place internal measures to protect your intangible assets. Uh, these are referring to things like, for example, uh, your processes, your systems, your trade secrets, the data. These are things that you can put in place, certain internal measures uh, that can actually help you manage the sharing with your partners over there and also decide, okay, how much can I share, which are not the so critical ones and, and which is not going to je jeopardize my business, et cetera. So at the very least, put in place these kind of internal measures to protect yourself. And be prepared to actually adopt a flexible approach, okay? Because as mentioned earlier, right, different countries have different levels of IP protection and even the enforcement procedures can vary very greatly. So that may require uh, market-specific IP strategies to be developed. So be adaptable and adopt a flexible approach, such as consider ways to resolve your IP dispute uh, other than via formal litigation. Okay, some examples could be through things like local mediation or arbitration, 
which may lead to better business outcome and quicker results. Okay. And you should always consider your dispute resolution upfront when entering into partnership. So this kind of ties in with the termination part as well. So termination clause have a dispute resolution clause as well. How should you settle disagreements between uh, partners? All right. So I'm just going to leave you with these five tips, uh, the top five things to take note of about your intangible assets when you're going overseas. We have some government support, which um, in our recent survey right, uh, by the government, we actually realized that a lot of companies are actually not aware of the different kinds of, of government support that may be useful for companies looking to go overseas uh, relating to their IP rights. So this is shared for your information. The first one is from iPods. Uh, for example, we have got things like, uh, nowadays you have iPods Go, which is a mobile app that allows you to file your trademark very quickly. You also have the SG IP fast track, which accelerates the filing of your IP rights. So because we are also in a lot of um, bilateral agreements with other countries, right? When you tap on this kind of fast track, it can, to a certain extent, accelerate a bit of your, your pattern or your trademarks filing overseas as well, because you can actually do examination sharing. Okay, so SPEC and, and PCT SPEC are one of those that actually allow you to do that. Okay. Another grant that um, some of you might have heard of, which is the Market Readiness Assistance by ESG. And I, I recently spoke with a client and they actually said that they were aware of it, but they thought it was just a set up office. But actually, as part of setting up office, right, it includes things like filing for your trademarks, filing for your parents. So IP rights uh, filing is actually supportable by the MRA. So do, uh, do consider this grant to defray some of the costs when you house some of your IP rights overseas. And the last one is actually a Discovery Intangible Assets Program. This is by IPOS International, which is really designed to help enterprises leverage on your intangible assets and your IP to maximize your growth opportunities, manage your risks and costs, and identify your strategic partnerships to actually achieve your business goals. So this program takes about six weeks to complete, and um, there is a pre-approved grant available for companies which you are working with uh, ESG on. So do reach out if you are interested and we can have a chat more to find out whether you are suitable for it. Because if you're not suitable, this wouldn't be a program that we would suggest you take on. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. So if you have if you require more information, you can actually reach out to me directly on my email. Uh, I'm found on LinkedIn as well. Or you can reach out via, uh, to have a complimentary chat session via this QR code, which we will flash again later on. All right, thank you, Jingwei, for the useful tips. And so now uh, we'll pass the time and the stage to Tyler, who will share strategies for successful overseas intangible assets or IP deployment. Um, Tyler, please. Great. Thank you, Peiwan. And Jingwei, thank you for, those, uh, for that information and uh, your presentation there. So let me go ahead and open up this uh, document so you guys can see. The slides that I've got prepared for you today, and I'm, and I'm thankful to have this time to speak with you. So I think overall, um, it's it. Some of you may have heard of Everedge, um, some may not. So I just want to start off by saying a quick introduction of who I am and who the company is. So Everedge, we we are intangible asset specialists. And if you ask me, well, what, what does that actually mean? Um, we actually break down what we do to people. Um, in, in four simple, simple steps. Um, our, our company is located actually uh, in Australia, New Zealand, the US, and we've done over 2000 client engagements. And when we break the process down of how we help companies, what we do with them, we break it down into four simple steps, which is to help them identify the intangible assets that they have in their business. And then secondly, help them to identify and reduce the risks of those assets, similar to you know, the steps that Jinwei spoke about, those are all very good, good steps. And so I'm actually going to take what she's provided and build on that a little bit today. Um, the third step is we help them assess the value, um, assess what is good, what is bad, and actually put valuation against it. Tell them, uh, you know, what numbers you should be expecting for your IP, for your business, that type of thing. And once you know that, then you can actually unlock the business value. You can actually do something with it once you've taken that step. So those first five steps are very important and I would agree with all of them wholeheartedly. Um, so the next sort of bullet points that I wanna talk about today is some other discussion points around if you are going globally uh, and how you can best manage your intangible assets 
and for your plan, we're going to go through step six through 10. So it's really important once you've done the identification process, somewhat Jinwei spoke about, and you know what you have, then you have to understand, you know, how you're going to do it into the market that you're going to in go into. Now, that intangible asset position will be very, very important uh, because it sets up two primary things. First, it'll help you let to it'll help you to know what your opportunity size is. And it'll help you know what is the market we're going into um, based on the strengths of my intangibles. If I have a product or service that I know is very unique, but is only unique in Singapore alone, then I know my opportunity size is, is just Singapore. As I'm going overseas, I need to know, will this transfer translate into Malaysia or Indonesia or the Philippines? Or if I'm going out to the US or to the UK, what does that mean? And so you have different, different options and different plans based on how well you protect your intangible assets and what assets you have. So if it first impacts your total opportunity size, it's, it's because the amount of wealth and total economic activity that is gonna be created is from those assets that you have. And let's start off by using this example, okay? If you have a good product, but you have a strong intangible asset position, uh, but the product isn't that good, then no one cares, no one copies you. If you have a weak position, no one cares, no one copies you, okay? What happens is, is once you start to have a product success, okay, you either end up in a bucket where everyone tries to copy you, all right, because you aren't able to protect what is unique and what is special about your business, or you end up in the uh, place where you can protect it and you're able to generate additional margins or actually control the market share a bit. So understanding um, what you have first is really important to help you then go into uh, what those commercialization options are going to be. Now, any intangible asset, a product or a service, okay, can be, can be commercialized. And I'm gonna talk about three primary methods, okay? First, you can deploy it yourself. Now, that's simplified by saying, you can go and sell it. You can do everything yourself, okay? You can manufacture it, you can make it, uh, you can provide the service directly. Uh, that's one method to go overseas and break into a new market. Now, another one is licensing, okay? So you can license it, okay? And that's basically allowing someone else to do a portion or part of the process. It might be to uh, manufacture the product. It might be just the marketing channel. It might be to distribute it. Um, and in return, they end up paying you a royalty for that. So that's licensing it. And the last one is you could sell it. If you have a business in Singapore, and you think, well, we've done a very good job, uh, but I'm not really sure how this will translate if I go to Australia, as an example, right? Maybe you say, well, maybe I don't want to go to the headache and try and set it up. And even licensing it, I don't really know I'll have the, that much control. So you might end up say, well, let's actually just sell it. And you can sell territorial rights to that product or service, okay? So... <clears throat> We're going to talk about so those three options as we as we talk about expanding globally, um, <clears throat> and why it's important to know your intangible asset position in this is because what it does is if we look at those options, uh, a sale might be the least amount of of input. You say, well, all right, let's do one time transaction. We'll sell it, but you may only get paid one time for it. So a sale may not be the most amount of reward you could get if you're looking at a long term play. Whereas a licensing play, yep, it takes a little bit more effort to get established. You've got to negotiate it properly and you've got to maintain it and manage it for however long that license agreement is. So you end up with potentially larger rewards. Um, whereas if you want to do the entire deployment yourself, the time and resources takes longer. Um, but again, you may end up benefiting from, uh, from the output. Um, you have all of the profits yourself and you, you gain, gain that benefit for a longer period of time. So what does it mean when you have a strong intangible asset position against this? It bends the curve a little bit, okay? What happens is it takes it so that if you are going to sell, you may end up being able to negotiate higher value. You may be able to uh, show the assets and why they're beneficial to the potential buyer. Uh, 
because they may be looking at purely numbers and you can show them the intangibles that are included with that. Now, if you have a very strong intangible asset position over a license agreement, what that does is it allows you to control it. They may not have other options to go to. There may not be other um, companies that they can go to and therefore you can control a lot of those negotiations. Even then, if you go to a full deployment model, you end up bene benefiting the most. Now, what happens in, in a weak position? If you haven't done the process of setting up your business, you haven't gone through the process of looking at your intangible asset strategy and planning something out. Well, you may not even be able to sell it at all because no one wants it to something that is not protectable. License deal won't hold water, so you probably don't have the option to license it either. And if you end up going for a deployment model, you're going to spend a lot of time and effort for very, very little output or reward, those subsistence margins like we talked about. So the method that you use in going to other markets is quite important. All right. So think about that if you think a sale, a license, or full deployment, depending on the resources you have and the team you have, um, that, can, that can drastically change you know, your mode of entry into a new, in, into a new country. Now, this next piece is, is very important. Know your value for an exit. And answer the question, why do you want to expand globally? Why do you want to go into a new market? And most of the time, the reason is, well, you want to make more money. You want to return, you want to return revenue to your shareholders. Okay? Or you want to build a business. Um, and so knowing what you, your end goal or your exit strategy is, is a very important part of the process. Okay? And when people talk to me about valuation, so I'm a chartered value and appraiser, um, a CBA in Singapore. And a lot of the conversations and discussions I have with companies are, okay, well, what is this worth? And, and, and you know, how do we value this? Okay, well, we're going to go through that. It's a boot camp. We'll get a little bit technical, so please don't tune out. <laughs> Most people look at valuation and start off with fixed assets in cash in a business and then look at the cash flows of the business. Now, this is a very, very common way to, to value a business. You may hear it as a income method or a discounted cash flow model. Those are terms that are typically used to describe this uh, way to value a business. Now, um, sometimes the, it, it might include something like a multiple on earnings or a EBITDA multiple or an EV multiple. Um, and sometimes it's... Uh, it's based on a sales multiple. So you'll hear those terms as you talk about value and how to value a business or a product or service. Now, if you stick only with that model, the major asset group that you're leaving out is the intangible assets. And what happens is when you put those into the equation, you start to unlock strategic value in your discussions and your negotiations. And they are a significant lever that can move the value of the business or the product beyond just a multiple of cash flows or a multiple of sales and into an, a, becoming a product or service that they cannot live without that they have to have. Now, if you don't go through the process to identify what is unique and valuable and protect it, then you could have a significant amount of risk and no one wants to buy something that isn't protected well. So it's very important that you go about that. And knowing the process and where you're at in valuing your business or your product or service is really important. This is an interesting chart that I work with that I, that I use to help discuss an exit approach or exit uh, you know, curve, all right? So this is a hypothetical business. And let's say you are um, you know, down just starting off a business and you're doing you know, less than a million dollars a month, or less than a million dollars a year in revenue, okay? and you're slowly wanting to get to an exit event, okay? Well, you need to be asking certain things. Like, okay, well, when should I be looking for an exit event? Who is the right, bar who is the right partner? Who should I be going out to? And can I continue to deliver returns? Is it the peak of my, of my growth right now, or am I not even close to that? You wanna map out the growth of the business in the country you're going to, and make sure that it's clear, okay, when is the right time to exit the business? Because an exit may not just be, oh, I've sold the business and now I walk away and wash my hands. A lot of times you end up with that business for the next two years, maybe five years um, under the contracts with the seller 
I'm um, sorry, with the new buyer, as you as a seller, you're contracted to the buyer to continue to run that business and continue to deliver results. So know what your value is so that you can plan the right exit event, okay? And to do that, you know, you have to do a, a valuation at the right time, okay? And it's, you know, doing a valuation on your intangibles or doing a valuation on your business. Um, look, I wouldn't recommend to do it just because, hey, I want to know the value of my business, okay? Make sure it's timed around a strategic event, okay? They take a lot of time. They take management ex experience and their management distraction, um, and, they're, and they can be expensive. And so you want to make sure that you say, look, we know why we need to do it. We've got a reason for it. So let's go ahead and, and plan that out as part of your plan. And as you do that, like I've said, do not overlook the, the, the value of the intangibles as that process. So the reason is, is we've seen a lot of information through the week, I'm sure, around you know, the value of intangibles is continuing to increase. Okay? Things like data and content and patents, um, internet assets, just continuing, continuing to, to rise in value. Um, so as you go through the, the process to identify those, make sure the discussion isn't around just to the company's fixed assets and around the cash flows. Make sure that it's a discussion around value and you include the intangible assets as part of that. And even though we say this, every time I talk with management teams, I still see companies that are very, very focused on the fixed assets. They spend so much time tracking chairs and laptops um, and, and plant and equipment, putting labels on things, but they don't spend the time to say, how big is our data set? How are we managing our software? Um, how, are we, how are we managing our brand and our, our company culture? Those intangible assets can be significantly valuable. And what happens is the value that's reported on a balance sheet does not reflect the true value of your business. Now, I'll give you two quick examples of, of uh, projects that I worked on where this was very, very important. So uh, a company um, <clears throat> that I worked with in Australia was doing a joint venture with a company in the United States. They wanted to expand into the US and they agreed to do a 50-50 joint venture um, with the US company. Now, both parties um, agreed that it was going to cost around $50 million based on the forecast and the performance that they had put together. So they said, all right, we want it to be 50-50. You put up $25 million in cash. We'll put up $25 million in cash. It sounds fair. Well, my client said, well, I don't like the sound of that because we actually are contributing a significant amount of the intangibles. It was our software. It was our developer team. It was our data. It's our platform. It's our ideas. And you've got some market presence, but it doesn't quite weigh up, you know, measure up if you put them apples to apples. So they asked us to do a valuation. We did the valuation and we, show, we highlighted the value of what their intangible asset impact was. And we end up sharing that with the, with the US company and we ended up saving our client $22 million in cash in the deal and they stayed at as a 50-50 JV partner. Um, and the thing that moved the lever was the discussion around the intangibles. So track them, make sure you know what you have and make sure the discussion doesn't always stick around price but it goes all the way into um, what are the other assets that will be contributed in something like a JV. Um, now, the second one was another client that I worked on. This is a software business, okay? And the client was approached by um, KKR Excel out of San Francisco, a uh, big venture capital group to acquire the business. And they requested Everest to do evaluation and to help them negotiate better. When they originally, their first offer from, the, the company they were offered uh, was about three times sales was what was offered to them uh, to buy the company. And our valuation report, when we went through and broke down all the assets was eight times sales. So it was a multiple of eight times their current sales. Now that seems like a huge, huge gap, uh, you know, and it was an interesting story because the CEO called me and he said, hey, Tyler, you know, they've just read your, your, read your report. And they said, you know, it's, it's, it's just too high. We can't really do a deal with you. And I think you've just blown up my deal. And I said, look, 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 Eddie, let's get on the phone with them and let's do a page turn. Let's go through the report that we wrote. And so we did. We scheduled a call. We went through it. We went through point by point. And I said, okay, how many of these points are wrong? Tell me how many of these assets you don't want. 
you have you can go ahead and buy the buy the company but if there's any things you don't want if you don't want their brand if you don't want their lead developers if you don't want their software code if you don't want and we went through the list if you don't want any of those we'll gladly take them out of the deal and ended up we they ended up settling on 7.4 times sales um and so the, the the again the real discussion points was forced around the intangibles and not just cash flows of the business. So if you are looking to go global and if you are looking to, to expand, you know, it's really important that you have the right people. You've got, um, you know, the, 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 the process and you understand the process so that you know when to do things. So the next point is assemble your team and prepare, okay? And prepare well. So if you think you've done your homework, you're going to go into the US or the UK or Australia or even Indonesia or Malaysia, somewhere nearby, make sure you do your homework, okay? Make sure you have a, a very, very uh, good understanding of where you're going into. And sometimes, and especially if you have other parties that you're working with through a sales process, make sure you have a, uh, have a good team around you. So as we work through, I think it'd be helpful just understanding as, 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 a, as a boot camp, we say, look, we're going to give you a lot of takeaways. And some of these you won't, won't apply to all businesses or, or your particular role. But it is really important for you to understand what the overall process looks like. So let's say we're selling a business or selling IP, okay? It is a very, very simple process, okay? The intangible assets are developed, they're used, and then they start to create some type of a category creation, okay? You're using them to do something. You're creating a new market. You're creating a niche. You're being able to generate revenues and you're creating that category. And then comes around, you say, look, we need to do something, okay? Let's get into a deal. Let's either sell, license, or deploy this, okay? Once you get to that process, you say, okay, let, let's license this or let's sell this, okay? Now the negotiation starts. You know what you're doing. You start the negotiation process. Once you've negotiated all the terms, you know what it is, then you bring in the, the lawyers to help them draft and make sure you've got everything buttoned up and make sure everything is cleaned, um, you know, so that you can properly transfer the IP, transfer those assets to the new business. Now, this is a very, very simplified process. And if you wanna see the overall detailed process, uh, this is a much, much more detailed overview of, of that process as far as just deal preparation all the way through to deal execution. Um, so depending on where you're at in the process, you know, identify, evaluate, manage, and then you can actually do something like uh, execute or, um, you know, sell the, sell the assets that you have. All right. And then the last point I wanted to come up with or at least talk about is, look, make sure you are using all the available resources. You know, Jinwei pointed at this as well. There's, there's resources available from, from IPOS, from, from ESG and other government agencies. You know, look at the partners and the ecosystem that is around you. Make sure you are using those available resources uh, through the process. And as you as you work through each of these you know boot camp points just for discussion right some of these may apply to you and some may not depending on the stage of your business okay but hopefully they've opened up your 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 thinking and you say well there's there's been some points that we might need to dive into a little bit more so if you want more information again you can reach out to me um you can reach out to the the, the team at ipos um, you can actually uh, request a little bit more information on our briefing paper or even some market research from us uh, regarding intangible asset valuations, you know, strategy and, um, and transaction services for, for intellectual property. Happy to work with you on that. Um, but now I think we want some time for Q&A. So Paywan, I will pass it back to you and um, we'll jump into the Q&A part. So, yes, thanks, thank Tyler. Thanks for the insightful sharing. And you know, since this is a boot camp, right? Actually, I would like to launch a poll to see, you know, how much our attendees have actually learned from all the sharing. So maybe let's come up with a poll and then we'll see, you know, we'll ask some simple questions. All right, the poll um, has been launched now. So uh, please, you know, um, try to answer them and then we'll see if we need to revise some of the key points or not.
All right, about 30% of the attendees have voted. Okay, Tyler Jingwei, interesting, but I do see a mix of um, answers or a mix of response. Okay, 10 more seconds and we will show the results of the poll and then we'll probably get Jingwei and Tyler to, um, to go through um, some of the uh, answers. All right, um, can we show the results of the poll? Okay, Jingwei, Tyler, can we welcome you back to the stage? So this is the response from our attendees. Okay, let's look at question number one. Maybe- Yeah, I thought everyone did great. <laughs> You're all listening. <laughs> yeah. Is, so just, okay, for the, okay, maybe for question one, right? For the benefits of people who have choose the other two uh, answer, maybe uh, Jingwei or Tyler, you want to just go through question one. Yeah, okay, I'll take question one. Tyler, you can take the, the next two. So um, so the first one, right, uh, assumes the technology is protected. So I didn't really cover this because everyone kind of have a bit of basic understanding of IP rights, right? So technology is generally protected um, via patents rather than trademark. So there are, two, there are two issues here in this option. One is that it's only found in Singapore. So it's by jurisdiction, China is not protected. The other one is it's the wrong kind of IP rights. So a lot of people assume that I fought for IP and then they just assume patterns equals to trademarks equals to everything else. But each of these are actually different uh, kinds of rights. They have different uh, registration process and you have to manage them differently. Okay, so just need to take note of that. Um, the four page is, uh, okay, I apologize for this. There's a bit of typo here. This is a silent. So it's basically saying that the partnership agreement is silent on IP. So it does not talk about IP rights, which is very common. We see it very often in some of the uh, customers or companies that we talk to. And we tell them, please go to your lawyers and make sure this is rectified. Okay. Um, so if you are going to bring your technology and your team to China, you're going to train them out, you're going to build up manufacturing capabilities for them. Think about what's going to stop them from cutting you out if you have nothing on IP inside your contract. Okay. So this is going to be very risky for any company that actually enters into this kind. But unfortunately, it's one of the most common situation we've seen. Okay, so the last one actually covers pretty much all the five, um, January five points that I've shared. So congratulations to the majority who answered that correctly. Yeah, so I'll pass it back to Tyler for the next two questions. Excellent. Well, the, the second one is a, is a really good question and it's open for, for debate. But, um, you know, for fast global expansion, is it best to grow through acquisitions or organic growth? Now, almost every, more than half said it depends. Um, and that, that would be right. Um, but let me actually just talk through some of the pros and cons of an acquisition uh, model into a new category or a new territory versus organic expansion. Um, because both, yeah, doing a mix, yeah, you can do a mix. Um, but let's just talk about the first two because those are kind of option one or option two. And only four people said organic expansion. So obviously that is not the preferred method. Uh, and that would be most, most of the time, um, you know, we'd recommend from a, a intangible asset standpoint, you know, organic expansion is harder. It takes longer and sometimes it's a lot more costly um, uh, because you have to basically figure out a lot of the problems of the, of the company that is already operating in that space. And so sometimes it's rebuilding what's already there. Um, another really interesting piece around um, acquisitions versus organic expansion is uh, balance sheets, okay, and reporting uh, on the the, your, the value of your business. And the, if I use an example, let's say you've got two companies. One company expands through acquisitions, and they go out and buy a bunch of companies. At the end, they've got five plants that are producing, let's say, chairs. Okay, they're producing chairs in. Yeah, across Malaysia, they expanded out of Singapore. And on their balance sheet, every time they acquired a new factory to produce chairs, they were able to assign that as an asset on their balance sheet. Now, the company that did it the other way through organic expansion, every time they got in, bought the land, they hired people, they buy equipment, a lot of times the, 
the services and the people and the, that cost ends up getting expensed instead of capitalized from an accounting standpoint. So even though at the end of say five years, they may both have five plants in Malaysia producing chairs and they can produce the same product. But from a balance sheet standpoint, the first company that did through acquisitions actually has a stronger balance sheet and shows more value on their, on their balance sheet, which they can borrow against. And it's easier to make the, 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 the case that they can then go out and sell that easier. Um, so that's just one of the things you may want to look at as you're looking at, um, you know, acquisitions in organic, uh, you know, through your M&A process or through just your general growth strategy, as we talked about, you know, deployment methods and commercialization methods. Um, and I think the other piece there is, um, you know, an acquisition, a lot of times you end up getting there much faster because you can acquire the business and you're ready to go within six months or a year or something like that, depending on the size of the business. Organic expansion it may take you two or three years to build that up yourself. Uh, it really just depends. So, um, and the last, uh, the third question there, let's see. All right, LK Steel has a great product that sells very, very well mainly in Singapore and is ready to look outside of Singapore. Which commercialization methods should be explored to test market suitably without mar making a large investment? Full deployment, license model, sell the regional rights, or all the above? All right, so license model definitely won that one. And I would probably go with that as well as, as the first option that you would want to test. You know, so that is the first case study you would probably draw up with your management team and a, board, a whiteboard and say, okay, if we do a licensing model, what does the numbers look like? How long does it take? How does this work? Who would be the parties we would work with? Um, the uh, second option there, or at least second most popular was all of the above. Uh, look, it's always best to test them all. Um, so look at your options, test them all and see which business case comes out on top for your particular situation. Um, but as I explained well in the commercializations, you know, um, you know, licensing can be very, very valuable if it's done well and you have very, very strong intangibles. Um, if you don't have the, the, the stamina or the team to really push it out long term, maybe you want to just sell the regional rights um, and let someone else handle it. That's always another option as well. So, um, yeah, so look, hopefully those were uh, helpful questions. Um, and, uh, you know, there's probably a, quite a bit of question and answer, at least uh, yes. discussion. <laughs> so, right. Paywan, do you want to pull up any other questions for us? Yes, because you're talking about the license model and things like that. There's one question that is very, um, I would say, very relevant to this point that you have made. Um, one question is, can one franchise the IP2? And maybe you can explain a bit um, between franchising and you know, licensing you know, the differences yeah, so that it helps our attendees. Tyler, do you want to help sure. with this? Yeah, question? well, look. Okay, so look, uh, definitely look, franchising is, um, is basically a structured way to license out your intellectual property, okay? Um, the, the word, fra you know, franchising is basically, it's helpful in, in saying, look, everything is going to be boxed up in a nice package, okay? So it's not just the brand, it's not just, but they're going to give you the operations, they're going to give you the process, they're going to give you the instruction manuals, they're going to give you all of that you know, as part of, of the franchise model. And so, um, yes, there's always a good option when you're looking at um, licensing your technology, explore the option, explore that, say, well, what if we actually started to license out not just the IP, our brand and our trademarks and our patent, but what about our know-how, our processes, the data we have, um, our marketing methods, all of that, then you start to see, ah, maybe this is a better fit for a, a franchise and, and working it out that way. And then you have to look at, you know, territories and locations and, um, but all of that ends up being included um, most of the time. And so that's your real sort of difference between a full franchise model and just licensing individual parts of IP. Hey, thanks Tyler for the, for the answer, I hope. Um, you know, our attendees can um, consider um, this model as well. All right, there's a couple of few questions. One of them, I see a lot of good sign. <laughs> um, and I think the question is also to Tyler. 
The question is, um, at what point do you carry out valuation of your IP? I think you have covered some of the points during your presentation just now, but it's good to also recap. Yeah, I, I mean, I get this question all the time. And the answer is, is when you have a, an event that requires it, okay? So significant events would be something like, let's say you're setting up a employee stock option plan and you need to be able to put a price on your shares where you're doing a, a capital raising event, okay? You're gonna go externally and raise money externally. You need to know what the company's worth. You need to know um, how much you're going to offer the shares of your business for. Um, if you're looking to sell the business, okay? Uh, you need to know what you are willing to sell it for. Um, I guess what you're willing to sell it for is different than what it's worth because <laughs> uh, that's typically much, much higher. <laughs> but um, but that, you know that's always a good trigger event. You say, look, we're looking at a potential sale um, and other, other, other events might be more regulatory, okay? So for you know, an audit, for um, testing for impairment, you may have to test a specific asset um, and that's annual. Um, or even for an IPO, uh, again, you know, through that, uh, through that process. So mm -hmm. those types of events is when you would typically do evaluation of your IP. Some larger companies will do them uh, to help with tracking of maybe KPIs. If, if you have a KPI within your firm to say, we need to increase innovation, we want to make sure that our intangibles are, are improved, um, and those are managed well, we need to have a starting point. So we'll do evaluation now and understand what are gonna be the impacts um, a year from now. And so then you rerun the process or just update the models that are created. And that ends up giving you, you know, the movement on the KPI year to year. So hopefully that's helpful on a couple of times when you would carry out evaluation. Yes, thanks Tyler. And if anybody would like some IP valuation kind of services, you can obviously uh, always approach Tyler for advice. All right, there's one question, um, actually two questions that's quite relevant and maybe I'll just direct the questions to Jingwei. Um, so Darren asks, uh, what are some common methods to protect IP in countries that may not have resources or will enforce them? Any yeah. advice for them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is quite common in um, a lot of countries that are actually not as developed in terms of the way they, um, in terms of IP regimes and all that. Um, so like I've mentioned earlier, right, a lot of these intangible assets that you have, actually you'll find maybe there is no way to register for them anyway, like your trade secrets, your data, your know-how and all this. And you'll find that these are things that reside within your company itself. So having in place certain uh, processes and procedures within your company and communicating them properly to your employees, to your partners, as well as having contracts to actually you know, allow you to have the legal fallback in case anything happens, are generally ways for you to actually manage all these intangible assets and make sure that you avoid having to even enforce it. Because enforcement, it goes down the legal route. When, when there, it's difficult for you to enforce, then that's not something you want to do anyway, right? It's not going to get any, any benefits. So just be aware of what you have and have in place some kind of processes and all that. Um, and if you need anyone to talk to about this kind of things, you can always reach out to us. We are here to actually provide the kind of advice to companies where we can. So just reach out to us via the, the IA chat sessions and we are happy to talk to you about this. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Jingwei. And one more question, just a follow-up as well. Mm -hmm. I see a similar questions. So Florence is asking, right, how can copyright such as slogans be protected? Yeah. Okay. So for slogans, right, actually there are a lot of um, companies that come with slogans, like short words, like just Nike's just do it. And companies can actually tr uh, trademark these. So trademark is actually a very, very broad, um, a, a very, a, 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 and a set class that allows you to protect a lot of things. Like there are smell marks, there are sound marks. Uh, so slogans like this, if you use it for your business very often and it represents your goods and services, you can consider filing a trademark for them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I see more and more questions coming in. We'll try to reply them uh, one by one using the chat functions, but I'm aware um, of the time. Now it's already 11. Let me just take one more um, last question. I thought it's quite interesting and we always get this kind of question asking. Um, maybe Jingwei, uh, Tyler can start first and then Jingwei can add on. The question is, are there marketplaces to sell IP? So, so thinking about IP that's no longer needed in portfolio, uh, is there any help in this area that you know you can share? 
Look, there are. I mean, I've worked with um, universities. I've worked with governments, uh, you know, in setting up sort of common marketplaces. And some companies even have their own. Um, now, are they successful? I mean, there isn't any that I've known that are, you know, amazingly successful. Um, you know, if you're looking to sell specific assets, you know, just listing it somewhere and hoping someone will see it is typically a poor strategy. Uh, you know, the best way to do would be to identify what you have and then put together a simple, you know, description of the technology, estimated value, how it would help particular companies, and then approach those companies directly, um, either by yourself or with an advisor through the process. Um, and that's going to produce a lot more results than just listing it on a, a site and hoping that someone will come around and, and find your technology that happens to fit what they do. Um, that's typically how we, we, what we've seen in the past. Okay. Okay. Um, there are some, like what, like what Tyler has said, right? There are some uh, platforms in, in the past that have tried marketplaces where you try to do auction houses for IP rights and all that. And, um, very few successes, I would say, because it's a little bit hard for them to just auction off an IP right like this because it, um, some of these IP rights may not fit nice in your portfolio and all that stuff, right? So like what Tyler said, right, the best option is actually to, you know, package it up and then approach very strategically certain people to actually try and pitch your product to them. Uh, in Singapore itself, right, I, in terms of the government agency side, right, there is an IP, IPI, which is an IP intermediary. They do provide an innovation uh, marketplace where... I think it's more focused on licensing rather than sale of your IP. So you can actually list, uh, get them to help you list your, your uh, technology that you hope to license out. Um, talk to IPI, they can actually help you with this. And they do do proactive um, uh, promotion and or trying to help you find suitable licensees and all this as well. So that can actually eventually lead to a sale of your technology if something that you assess you don't need in your portfolio anymore. Yeah, right. so those are one of those things you can approach um, uh, agencies for support on. Mm. Thank you, Jinghui. Thank you, Tyler. I think before you know, we end up by summarizing what we have learned today, um, we, we are going to launch the last poll. I promise it's the last poll, really to seek your feedback about this webinar and how we can further improve um, our future webinar as well. So while you are helping us with the poll, um, I will also um, share some of the resources that um, you can uh, recap on the resources that you can actually uh, uh, tap on. Um, Peter, if you can help us to also launch the slides. All right, a couple of things. So um, we do have some uh, complementary business guides that would be very useful um, for companies like yourself who are looking for overseas expansions. Um, so these are a couple of the business guides that uh, may be relevant to you. They are simple, easy to read. Um, and uh, we do have interactive videos to go with it. So you can just um, click on the QR code, download it and uh, learn more from it. Next slide. Um, Tingwei have also mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. we are also um, offering this complimentary intangible assets chat sessions. Um, so it's a complimentary 45 minutes chat sessions with our strategy. So if you have any things that you want to ask uh, more or seek advice and uh, or questions that we couldn't cover today, uh, feel free to just uh, book a chat session with us. And then just also as a recap, what Tyler have shared. So Average has this um, insights briefing paper on intangible assets valuation. So uh, do take note the email, info at averageglobal.com and drop um, them an email to request for that paper. All right, so last slide. This is the key takeaways. The 10 points, the most 10 uh, very important points from this bootcamp uh, from Jingwei and Tyler. If you have any questions um, that you would like to to get answered or you'd like to get in touch with them, um, you know, feel free to uh, talk to them. So their email address. Thank you very much for joining us. So we look forward to uh, meeting you again in our next uh, IP expert series webinar. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Jingwei. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jinwei. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.